Well, hello everybody. It's so good to have you together with us for lesson 18 of our class on Isaiah using the text by Avraham Gileadi, The End from the Beginning. Our reading was chapter 44. We're going to be exploring the use of metaphorical pseudonyms or code names in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 44 is in the center of that section that we've studied, 41 through 46, that grand chiasm, and this whole section is presented as a lawsuit between God and idolatry. God will establish 15 times that he is the only God, and that the entire creation of the heavens and the earth was planned for the purpose of bringing to pass righteousness and salvation for his elect, his children, righteousness being the servant in the end time and salvation being our savior, Jesus Christ himself. As the themes of creation and salvation become increasingly associated together, as we see those ideas of God being the creator and the actual word salvation being used in the text more and more frequently, the reality that God's plan is unfolding exactly as he planned and prophesied that it would from the beginning is God's legal proof that he is who he says he is. In contrast, trusting in any other thing to save us constitutes idolatry. And the themes of chaos and idolatry also become increasingly associated together as chaos motifs. Our idols, the materialistic things that we adore and the humanistic beliefs that we cling to are proven here to have no power or truth in them. Zion's socio-economic system in the book of Isaiah is rural and agriculturally based. It provides stability to a society. It lets the few that are governing at the top depend on the many producers at the bottom. God is its cornerstone. And you can see this in chapter 55. Why do you spend money on that which is not bread? Your labor on that which does not satisfy. Hear me well, eat what is good, good being covenant blessing, and your souls shall enjoy abundance. Now we see the contrast to that in Babylon's socioeconomic system, which is materialistic and idolatrous in its nature. It's based on the works of men's hands, and the large government structure at the top depends on the few producers at the bottom. It renders a society vulnerable, and it has a tyrant as its cornerstone in Isaiah. In chapter 44, verse 9, all who manufacture idols are deranged. The things that they cherish profit nothing. Those who promote them are themselves sightless and mindless to their own dismay. Their whole society is confused. Their fabricators are mere mortals. Now you can see this in the text here in Isaiah Illustrated, where we can learn that verse 9 through 20 is actually a big satire about idol makers, summing up them and their works as chaos and mere ashes. Their gods prove to be of no salvation in the day of judgment, but actually lead the people to destruction and the consequence of idolatry, which we'll see is always blindness here in the comment. So they remain in a state of blindness so long as they hang on to this economic system that manufactures and promotes and then sells these materialistic works of men's hands. They waste the days of their probation on earth in doing so. The purpose of coming to this world is not to get involved in the manufacture, promotion, and sale of idols, or to make a living that way. But our purpose is to worship God, to serve Him, and to promote His cause, to be a witness for Him, and so forth. The whole sojourn on this earth will have been wasted if that is the extent of their activities and their lifestyle, just buying the next new fad, the biggest, best phone, or the newest update on a computer, or whatever else it is that we worship. Idolatry can take any form. 
Any activity can actually become idolatrous if it consumes all of our time and we take our focus off of the Lord. On this slide, you can see Father Abraham in that apocalyptic story where his father Terah actually produces idols. And Abraham goes in and at one point chops down all of the idols in Terah's shop, except for the biggest one. And then he puts the ax in the largest idol's hand. And when his father Terah comes in furious that he has destroyed all of his hard work, Abraham tells him the big idol did it. And when Terah incredulously demands that Abraham tell the truth, Abraham tells him, how did you know that he couldn't do it? Why do you worship an inanimate object? And here in these images, you can see a lot of different forms that idolatry might take. And in all of these things, idolatry is anything that takes the place of God in our lives. Now, some of these things are perfectly innocent. To play games with your family, to go camping, that's not idolatry in and of itself. But if it's taking us away from our study of the scriptures, if it's taking away from our relationship with God, if it is monopolizing our time so that we don't have time for other things that would be serving God, that's what makes these things idolatry. Reading books is not bad in and of itself, but if it becomes our passion to read romance novels and we're not studying the scriptures, then that can be idolatry. Even seeking after education can become a form of idolatry if we put God aside for our humanistic ideas. Satan doesn't care what we worship as long as we don't worship God. Here in this satire in Isaiah chapter 44, we can see that as Isaiah is describing all the different things that we make with our own hands, we notice that we're still mortal. He even begins to grow faint and weary, which is in contrast to God who does not grow weary in the book of Isaiah. And God notes that even in our most beautiful, beautiful, idolatrous creations, they resemble man's beauty, something that he created. And we build it out of elements or trees that he caused the rain to make grow. It kind of reminds me of that joke where they have the scientist that's challenging God and saying, I can create life, I can make a human being. That's, that's not a big deal. And, and God says, well, go ahead, let's, let's see you do that. And so the, the scientist begins to take the dust and, and the water and, and create what's going to be the source of his life. And God tells him, no, 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 you need to use your own mud. Now, here again in verse 18, we see that by elevating and worshiping the works of our own hands, that it makes the society unaware and insensible. Their eyes are glazed so they cannot see. In Isaiah, the result of idolatry is always blindness. Their minds are incapable of discernment. And some examples of this might be things like becoming unaware and insensible because our focus is on conquering the next thing or even incapable of discernment. When a society doesn't discern that the very thing that they are tearing down are the things that caused them to be free. Men who fought for the freedoms that we enjoy in our country today. Now in verse 24, we notice that God is focusing in on his role as our creator. Thus says the Lord your redeemer who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord the maker of all things, who alone suspends the heaven, who himself gives form to the earth. And if we zoom in to the comment here, we can see that when God starts talking about himself as the creator in Isaiah, it's a clue that something important is coming up. What's coming up 
is a reference to the servant because the Antichrist in the end time, this arch tyrant, is symbolized by chaos and the servant is symbolized by creation. And so it is the creator of God, the all-powerful maker of heaven and earth, who lends the servant his authority, who validates the servant and his mission. And so every time when there's a servant passage coming up, you have this motif that God is the creator. I love these Mormon ads that kind of focus in on what our desired response is in the end time. It's not to concern ourselves with the arch tyrant or fear his power. It is to repent of our transgressions and to keep the terms of God's covenant. It is to keep our eye focused on him. Now this Mormon ad in the top left that says, set your sights, you can see it has an image of the temple in the iris of the eye. And this is so beautiful because this means that they are looking at the temple. Now in the Bible, there is something called the apple of your eye. And translated literally, it means the little man in the eye. And the idea is that when we look at someone else, their image in our eye is the little man in our eye. And it's called the apple of your eye. And if our focus is on the Lord, we can use our cell phones to serve others. We can use all of these things that might be idolatry if they replace God. We can use them for his service. But if our focus is on God, then he becomes the little man in our eye. He becomes the apple of our eye. And the beautiful thing about this is that when we are looking at him and he is looking at us, we are the apple of his eye, just like we saw in the center of our bifid structures. There are so many things that we can be doing to prepare for the times ahead where we are placing God as the apple of our eye. Isaiah combines in the person of this arch tyrant different character traits. And like we saw with the servant, it's a composite of several different ideas. The first one is the ancient kings of Assyria and their militaristic domination and terrorization of the world. The second idea is the idolatry of the kings of Babylon. And then there's a third idolatry, the self-exaltation that we see in Mesopotamian mythology. He conquers the world by military force. He enforces his false ideology, and possibly even rules the world from a space station. And we'll take a look at the verses that detail that in just a minute. Now this alliance of nation was the king of Assyria in the end time who conquers the world by military force from the north can be seen in the text in Isaiah 13. Hark, a tumult on the mountains as of a vast multitude. Hark, an uproar among kingdoms as of nations assembling. And you can see here that again, we've seen it before that mountains and kingdoms are in parallel. So we know that when we see the word mountains in Isaiah, it can be substituted as a nation or a kingdom. It's a metaphor symbolizing the kingdoms of this world. Jehovah of hosts is marshalling an army for war. They come from a distant land beyond the horizon. Jehovah and the instruments of his wrath to cause destruction throughout the earth. And remember that wrath in Isaiah is the king of Assyria. And we're going to see how we figure that out with our metaphorical pseudonyms that we're going to learn about towards the middle of this lesson. In Isaiah 29, verse 5, Suddenly, in an instant, your crowds of evildoers shall become as fine dust, your violent mobs like flying chaff. She shall be chastened by Jehovah of hosts with thunderous quakings, resounding booms, tempestuous blasts, 
and conflagrations of devouring flame. Imagine a giant forest fire totally out of control, a conflagration. And in Isaiah 9, we get even a clearer picture of the kind of weapons and warfare that this alliance of nations is perpetrating on the world. Wickedness shall be set ablaze like a fire, and briars and thorns shall it consume. It shall ignite the jungle forests, and they shall billow upward in mushrooming clouds of smoke. Can you believe Isaiah saw this in 700 BC? Mushrooming clouds of smoke. At the wrath of Jehovah of hosts, the earth is scorched, and people are but fuel for the fire. The arch tyrant burns up cities and destroys the nations of the wicked. He plunders the people's wealth and confiscates their riches. Now we've seen this before and we've looked at these verses where, like in 2 Peter, where it says the day of Jehovah will come as a thief in the night. The day of Jehovah, this wrath, this end time labor that the earth goes into comes as a thief in the night because the tyrant is the thief in which the heavens shall pass away and with a great noise and the elements melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Then again in Isaiah we saw, I have impounded the wealth of the peoples like a nest. I have gathered up the whole world as one gathers abandoned eggs. And in that next verse it says, and no one dared utter a peep. In D&C 106 it says, and again, verily I say unto you, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night. Therefore, gird up your loins, that you may be the children of light, and that day shall not overtake you as a thief. He is the thief that comes in the end time. He comes in the day of the Lord, but the Lord is not the thief. He acts as God's instrument to pay the wicked their due. He wants to rule the world, but only serves God's purpose. He comes to an end when his work of destruction is done. Now, the second type that Isaiah is going to use to draw a picture of this end time king of Assyria is the king of Babylon. He is a self-styled demigod following the pattern of the idolatrous emperors of Babylon. And you can see here in this image a ziggurat. And this one is the ziggurat of Ur, the city that Abraham came from anciently, which is today in Assyria, Iraq. It was built during the 21st century BC, dating it right back to Abraham's time, in the time of King Nimrod. And it was excavated by Sir Leonard Woolley in 1922 to 1934. Saddam Hussein in the 1980s actually redid the facade and the monumental staircase in the front there. And a ziggurat means a platform between heaven and earth. And it was often surmounted by a temple and this would be the place where ancient kings would go up to declare themselves God. And foreign nations, when they conquered Babylon, would themselves take the title, the King of Babylon, meaning the God of the world. Now this idol King of Babylon in Isaiah ascribes to himself supreme Godhood. He demands the worship of all humanity and he rules the earth from above the clouds, which is very interesting. We'll take a look at that. He exemplifies an all-time arc tyrant. Isaiah's metaphorical language here draws on Mesopotamian mythology to portray the king of Assyria as a predestined power of chaos. And we see this in Isaiah 37. Against whom have you raised your voice, lifting your eyes to the high heaven? Against the Holy One of Israel, by your servants, you have blasphemed the Lord. You thought, 
On account of my vast cherry tree, I have conquered the highest mountains or nations, the farthest reaches of Lebanon. I have felled its tallest cedars and its choicest cypresses. I have reached its loftiest summit and its finest forest. We're seeing mythological imagery here where they're conquering the world. I have dug wells and drunk of foreign waters, and with the soles of my feet, I have dried up all Egypt's rivers. Which is a little scary in the end time when you realize that America is a type of Egypt. Have you not heard how I ordained this thing long ago? How in the days of old I planned it? Now I have brought it to pass. Here again, we're seeing that motif of God's fulfillment of prophecy being his legal proof that he is who he says he is. You were destined to demolish fortified cities. Watch the chaos motifs here. Turning them into heaps of rubble while their timorous inhabitants shrank away in confusion, becoming as wild grass, transiently green. Here in Utah, just imagine June grass. In June, it looks beautiful, but by August, it's just tinder for a forest fire. Or like weeds on a roof that scorch before they grow up. And in Isaiah 14, I will seat myself in the mount of assembly of the gods, in the utmost heights of Zaphon or Mount Olympus, I will ascend above the altitude of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. And that's that verse that infers that he might have control of a satellite that, from which he attacks or be in some sort of a position like the space station. And watch this interesting verse in Isaiah 24, 18. For when the windows on high are opened, the earth shall shake to its foundations. The earth shall be crushed and rent. The earth shall break up and cave in and convulse and lurch and shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. So here we see in the end time that this devastation in the earth is caused by this arc tyrant. And we see here a satellite that's being developed by China that has the ability to use laser technology to detect submarines more than 500 meters below the surface. Now with the use of laser technology, clouds or disturbances in the atmosphere can cause the laser beam to scatter. So they have to wait until there's a clearing or a window in the atmosphere to use this technology. And perhaps that is what we just saw in Isaiah. When the windows of heaven are open, then the attack comes. God's end time servant is the counterpoint to this arch tyrant. He, on the other hand, establishes justice and righteousness in the earth. He saves from destruction God's people who repent. He releases God's people from captivity and tyranny. He guides God's people to safety in the day of Jehovah. And he assists God's people in rebuilding the ruined places. He ushers in a righteous civilization that loves God. Look in Isaiah 54. Poor wretch, tempest-tossed and disconsolate, I will lay antimony for your building stones and sapphires for your foundations. I will make your skylights of yakinth and your gates of carbuncle and your entire boundary of precious stones. Do you remember in Isaiah that precious stones are celestial people and semi-precious stones represent a terrestrial category? All your children shall be taught by Jehovah and great shall be the peace of your posterity. You shall be firmly established through righteousness and you will be far from oppression and have no cause to fear far from ruin, for it shall not approach you. So this time of the wrath is set aside for those who didn't heed the call to repent, the call to gather to Zion, 
and who are left out in the darkness of the reign of the end time tyrant. God's plan of action for us is that we do not fear. Do you recognize these heroic pictures? Samuel the Lamanite, Lehi and Nephi in the book of Helaman bearing testimony to the Lamanites there. And Paul and Cyrus in the New Testament not afraid of anything that man might do, only fearing their God and that they fulfill the mission that they were sent to declare repentance to these people. We are not to fear no matter how disciplined or organized the enemy. No weapon, and we're going to look at this first, no weapon designed to destroy his people is able to hurt them, no matter how deadly. Though the arch tyrant exalts himself above all peoples, God thrusts his soul down to hell. God planned the destruction of the wicked by the wicked in the end time, from ancient times, from the very beginning. Those who gather into mobs are not of me. Whoever masses against you shall fall because of you. It is I who creates the smith who fans the flaming coals, forging weapons to suit his purpose. It is I who create the ravager to destroy. Whatever weapon is devised against you, it shall not succeed. Every tongue that rises to accuse you, you shall refute. This is the heritage of the servants of Jehovah, and such is their vindication by me, says Jehovah. Now, when we highlight our text in Isaiah Illustrated, the gray color, of course, stands for the arch tyrant, and the yellow color stands for the servant and the servants that follow him. And we can see here that the word vindication is highlighted in yellow. So let's look in the text of Isaiah Illustrated and see why we highlighted that yellow. Vindication and righteousness is the same word in Hebrew. Their righteousness is of me, says the Lord, or their vindication is of him. Which means when you put the servants and the vindication together, that because of the parallelism there, the servants have emulated the one servant who personifies righteousness, and they themselves have now become righteous. He is an exemplar of righteousness in the book of Isaiah. He's marred, he proves himself faithful under all conditions, and the Lord makes with him an unconditional covenant. In all of those respects, he is a model for them to follow. And other servants emerge in the text of Isaiah from this covenant people of God. Now, as we take a look at these metaphorical pseudonyms or code names for the tyrant and the servant in the book of Isaiah, it's very important to realize that many words are used for both of them. They can be used to represent the left hand, which is the tyrant, or the right hand, which is the servant. Shared code names denote an arch rivalry between the two and that they are contemporary. They appear at the same time. Words that you might see that could represent either one are words such as bow, branch, breath, enzyme, fire, flame, lips, and mouth. And the way we tell these names, these metaphorical pseudonyms, the way we tell which character they apply to is by looking at the context of the verse. And then you'll be able to tell which one it is. The tyrant is called the prince also in the book of Daniel, whereas in the book of Ezekiel, the prince is the end time servant. You'll also see words such as rod, the scourge, the staff, the sword, a tongue, a voice, a warrior, the wind, 
and zeal. All of these names have double application and we look at the context to see which one they are referring to. Now, of course, there are some names that apply to only the tyrant, never to the servant, such as anger, the king of Assyria. That's a direct identification there. The ax, the king of Babylon, bridle, broom, darkness, death, downpour, dragon, flood, fury, heat, indignation, little horn in the book of Daniel and Revelation, rage, retribution, river, sea, slaughter. And there's so much storm imagery that represents him. The tempest, the torrent, the wind, and the sea in commotion or stirred up. We're gonna look at these in just a minute. One of the main ones is that he is the wrath. He is the wrath in this last three and a half year end time period where he is in power. Now in the scriptures, there's other antichrist or tyrant names. We see him as the idol shepherd in Zechariah. We talked about the little horn in Daniel and in Revelation. We see him as a willful king or a vile king in Daniel chapter 11. He is a bloody and deceitful man in the book of Psalms. And he is the prince of Tyre in Ezekiel. And there's a lot of them there that you can find in the scriptures. The idea is that Isaiah is not the only one to use metaphorical pseudonyms to identify these people. The end of the world resembles the time of the great flood in wickedness and the widespread destruction of life. That's why one of his metaphorical pseudonyms is the flood. But he is also destructive, like the sea stirred up, heaving its waves beyond its bound, or like a river overflowing its banks and flooding the cities. The arch tyrants and armies overwhelm the wicked and inundate their lands leaving behind only disaster and desolation. Now for the fun part, let's go into the text of Isaiah itself and see some of these parallel statements where we can link together these different metaphorical pseudonyms for these different characters until we have a whole chain of names for them that describe their role in the end time. The first one we'll take a look at is Isaiah 8, verse 7. It says in the first part, the great and mighty waters of the river. And then right in parallel with that, it says the king of Assyria in all his glory. So here we have the king of Assyria being directly associated with the image of the river overflowing there. All right, another one. The king of Assyria is also paralleled here in the very next verse that he will sweep into Judea like a flood. So the flood becomes the image of this king of Assyria in the end time and his alliance of nation flooding beyond his borders and taking over in the world. Here in Isaiah 10, we have another direct association with the Assyrian, and we get a list of five metaphorical pseudonyms that can represent him in the Word of God. He is the rod of my anger. It's not God that is angry and wrathful and vengeful. It's the king of Assyria, but he is a tool in God's hand. He is the rod of my anger. He is a staff, my wrath in their hand. Now notice on this particular slide, you see that there's a little bit of a yellow highlight behind some of these metaphorical pseudonyms. That's so that you know that those particular words can also represent the good guy. They can represent the servant in the end time as well. But here you can tell from the context, it says, hail the Assyrian, that in this case, the rod, the staff, and the hand are representing the tyrant. Here in chapter 13 is an oracle concerning Babylon and the destruction of Babylon by the king of Assyria, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw in vision. Raise the ensign 
on a barren mountain and sound the voice among them, beckon them with the hand to advance into the precincts of the elite. So we see here in this case, even though enzyme, voice, and hand can also represent God's servant in the end time, in this case, it's representing that king of Assyria and that alliance of nations that comes to invade and destroy. Here in Isaiah chapter 5, after we have seven woes against God's people and the earth's inhabitants for all of their wickedness, that therefore the anger of Jehovah is kindled. Now, yes, you could read this, that Jehovah is not pleased with the persecutions and the idolatry of the people. But whenever you see that word anger, it also represents that tyrant. Therefore, the anger of Jehovah is kindled. He, Jehovah, raises that enzyme, the one that we just saw that is his left hand to distant nations. He, meaning the enzyme's armies in their attack in just a few verses later, shall be stirred up against them in that day, even as the sea is stirred up. So here we see the enzyme is paralleled with this image of the sea being stirred up. Now, stirred up is not a metaphorical pseudonym. It's not really a code name for him, but it is a description of him. And it's consistent. When you see things getting stirred up in Isaiah, he's usually behind the scenes. Let's take a look at that in a couple of different places in Isaiah, like in verse 30 of chapter 5. He is stirred up against them in the day even as the sea is stirred up. We just saw that one. But compare that to Isaiah 51. It is I, Jehovah your God, whose name is Jehovah of hosts, who stir up the sea so that its waves roar. Here we see that just like we saw earlier, God has predicted his rise in the end time. He has even facilitated it and allowed it because of the rampant idolatry and turning away from God in the end time. And the nations begin to be stirred up against each other and in their self-righteousness, pointing the finger at the other guy like they're the wicked ones, when really it is the wicked that will destroy the wicked. Here are some more verses about being stirred up in the end time. I know your comings and your goings and how stirred up you are against me. And then in chapter 17, woe the many people within an uproar whose rage is like the raging of the seas. Remember, the seas are the king of Assyria and his allies. Seas are the peoples of the world. Tumultuous nations and commotions like the turbulence of mighty waters. And now moving on to chapter 28, we can see that there's a synonymous parallel here. My Lord has in store one mighty and strong as a ravaging hailstorm sweeping down or like an inundating deluge or flood of mighty waters. He will hurl them to the ground by his hand. Now, I think this particular verse is pretty fascinating. Number one, we see again that that hand is equated with storm imagery here, the flood and the hailstorm, but also that here we have a bad guy that is one mighty and strong. In d 85, we see that there's a one mighty and strong that's clothed with light for a covering. He's a good guy. But here in Isaiah, the one mighty and strong is directly linked to the left hand, the tyrant in the end time. Here we see a few verses later in chapter 28, a hail shall sweep away your false refuge and waters flood your hiding place. Your covenant with death shall prove void. When the flooding scourge sweeps through, you shall be overrun by it. So making a covenant with him that he will pass us by when he comes through because we were his ally. Well, guess what? 
the tyrant, the king of Assyria, this antichrist in the end time, is treacherous and he betrays his allies. The arch tyrant in the image of a new flood carries some other connotations as well. He appears as a sea and as river and as death. And these were all Canaanite mythological powers of chaos that Isaiah is drawing the image of. But remember also that Moses stretched his staff over the sea and the greatest army in the earth was devastated. And Joshua subdued the river when they crossed over into the land of Canaan and defeated Jericho. At the end of the world, the servant subdues the sea and the river and delivers God's people from death. You can see how you can kind of read these metaphors on more than one layer, on more than one level, and that's why Isaiah uses them, so that we can get the imagery of several different things all at the same time. God chooses the king of Assyria or Babylon as his rod and his staff to punish the wicked of the world. The arch tyrant is also God's axe and saw. He hews down evildoers and he oppresses God's people. The proud and arrogant of the earth are like lofty cedars and mighty oaks that the arch tyrant lays low. Remember, trees are people. Cities resemble dense forests and nations are high mountains that he levels to the ground. These are all linking words to this imagery of the proud and the arrogant, the self-exalted being laid low in the end time. Now let's go in and look at the text and watch how Isaiah links the ax and the saw so that you know that he is the one that is as a hail felling the forests and leveling the cities. And here again, we see a parallel statement where we identify that forests in Isaiah can also be read as cities. We also see in chapter 64, another word that kind of describes the king of Assyria. It's not a metaphorical pseudonym for him. It's not a code name for him. But when you see it, just like when you saw being stirred up, when you see this quaking, you know that he is nearby. To make yourself known to your adversaries, the nations trembling at your presence, as when you performed awesome things unexpected by us, your descent of old on Mount Sinai, when the mountains quaked before you. Here we can see nations trembling and mountains quaking. Nations and mountains, again, are being used in parallel, and you can see that they are interchangeable. Now we saw Hail the Assyrian. We see here that he is the rod and the staff. This is the verse in chapter 10, one of those main verses. And once you link up these key words, you can start linking these metaphorical pseudonyms to other names for the king of Assyria, such as this. Shall an ax exalt itself above the one who hews it? Or a saw vaunt itself over him who handles it? as though the rod wielded him who lifts it up, as though the staff held up the one who is not made of wood. So here we see a direct parallel in verse 15 between the ax and the saw and the rod and the staff. And we can see also here that the king of Assyria takes all the glory to himself. He figures it's by his ingenuity and his craftiness that he has developed this power. But in reality, it is God allowing that ax to do its work and that saw. Jehovah of hosts has a day in store for all the proud and arrogant, for all who are exalted, that they may be brought low. And it shall come against all the lofty cedars of Lebanon that lift themselves high and against all the oaks of Bashan. There again, oaks and cedars are lofty people. Jehovah has broken the staff of the wicked, the rod of those who ruled. Him who with unerring blows struck down the nations in anger, 
who subdued peoples in his wrath by relentless oppression. Now the whole earth is at rest and at peace. There is jubilant celebration. The pine trees too rejoice over you, as do those cedars of Lebanon, the ones that repented. Since you have been laid low, no hewer has risen against us. So here we see him as an ax and a saw. Now we said that when there's quaking going on, you might take a look behind the scenes and look for the king of Assyria. Well, here he is as the anger and as that left hand again. Therefore, the anger of the Lord is kindled against his people. He draws back his hand against them and strikes them. The mountains quake and their corpses lie like litter about the streets. So here he is causing that quaking. We see it also in Isaiah 14. Is this the man who made the earth shake and the kingdoms quake? He personifies the anger and the wrath of God. He kindles against the evildoers in the day of Jehovah. As God's vengeance and fury and rage and indignation, we saw rage before. Let's, we're going to look closely at vengeance, fury, and indignation in just a second. He breaks forth on the wicked. He is the hand God has raised to smite the rebellious and covenant breakers among his people. He is an evil ensign, rallying an alliance of nations to conquer a world ripening in iniquity. Here is verse five and six in Isaiah chapter 10. Hail the Assyrian, the rod of my anger. I will commission him against a godless nation. I will appoint him over the people deserving of my vengeance. Remember that when he does his destruction, it is because the people have been warned not once, not twice, Three times testimony has been born, calling them to repentance, pleading with them to exit their idolatrous Babylonian ways, and they have refused and killed the prophets. And now is the time of judgment. We see it again in Isaiah 30. Behold, Jehovah Omnipotent coming from afar, his wrath is kindled. Heavy is his grievance. His lips flow with indignation. And we see again this double layer of reading. Jehovah is not happy with what they have done to his servants, but it is actually the king of Assyria that is the lips flowing with indignation and the wrath. Here we see the rage again. I trod nations underfoot in my anger, Anger is here now directly paralleled with, I made them drunk by my rage when I cast their glory to the ground. Do you see how Isaiah is connecting all of these metaphorical pseudonyms so you can get this picture of this end time villain? Here we're going to connect the rage with fury. Jehovah's rage is upon all nations his fury upon all their hosts. He has doomed them and consigned them to the slaughter. And here we get the slaughter associated with the rage and the fury as well. Now back to that ensign, that ensign that was raised on the barren mountain, that was the voice gathering the alliances of nations, beckoning them with the hand into the precincts of the elite. He is the voice of the wicked and the tongue speaking perverse things. We see that he opens his mouth insatiably, swallowing souls, and his lips are flowing with wrathful speeches. We're going to look now at the scourge of the wicked, a yoke of bondage about their necks, and that he is God's fire and sword bringing destruction as a power of darkness. He causes gloom and misery and veils the whole earth with darkness. Heavy is his grievance. His lips flow with indignation. 
And then in the parallel statement, his tongue is like a devouring fire. Here we're going to see that the mouth is in parallel with the anger and the hand in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. When he stirs up their adversaries, Aramaeans from the east and Philistines from the west will devour Israel with open mouth. Yet for all of this, his anger is not abated. His hand is upraised still. Now, if we look in the text on these verses in chapter 9, we find this phrase in the book of Isaiah five times. And we notice that in each event, it is intensifying. In the first time we saw it, clear back in chapter 5, the Lord's anger was kindled. And then the next time in chapter 9, the Lord strengthens the adversaries. Then in the next few verses, Israel's head and tail is cut off and there is destruction and devastation. And then finally in chapter 10, we see the captivity of God's people. So each stanza is intensifying like the chorus in a song, repeating over and over again. Now zooming into verse 12, we see it being used again here in chapter 9 and this reiteration of this phrase three times in chapter 9 and then one more time in chapter 10 might actually be a literary device denoting that the king of Assyria rampages in his tyranny for three years, three times in chapter 9 and again into the third year in chapter 10. And the question is, Will we repent after all of this? For his anger is not abated and his hand is upraised still. It is God's effort to call the wicked to finally stop their blindness and repent and come back to him. See, Jehovah comes with fire. His chariots like a whirlwind, there's your storm imagery again, to retaliate in furious anger and to rebuke with conflagrations of fire. For with fire and with his sword shall Jehovah execute judgment on all flesh. And there we see that the anger and the fire are here paralleled with a sword. I will break Assyria in my own land, trample them underfoot on my mountains. Their yoke shall be taken from them their burden removed from their shoulders. So right there in that parallel statement in chapter 14, verse 25, we see that the king of Assyria is putting that bondage and that yoke on the peoples in the end time. Here we can see in chapter nine that he is also darkness. And that of course is gonna be the extreme opposite of the servant who will represent light. And you can see that light has a tiny green highlight behind it because light is also a name for the Savior. Remember he said, I am the light of the world. Well, his servant is following after him and is also a light in the darkness in this time. The people walking in darkness have seen a bright light on the inhabitants of the land of the shadow of death has the light dawned. And in Isaiah, his coming, this righteousness, is like a dawning. It's a dawning of the millennial day. It's when light begins to overtake that darkness one bit at a time until it is noonday. I fashion the light and form the darkness. I occasion peace and cause Calamity. You can see light being paralleled with peace there and darkness being paralleled with calamity. And we'll see in just a minute how peace is also a metaphorical pseudonym for Jesus Christ himself. I, Jehovah, do all these things. The arch tyrant personifies God's anger, his wrath, his rage, his fury, his indignation. But God himself is kind, loving, gentle, patient, long-suffering. 
God uses a wicked person, the king of Assyria or Babylon, to destroy the wicked of the world, who oppress and threaten his loyal people with death. We remember from Isaiah 10 that we saw that he was the rod and the anger, the staff and the wrath. And if you parallel this description of the king of Assyria in chapter 10 with the description of the king of Babylon in chapter 14, you can see that the king of Babylon here is also called the staff, the rod, the anger, and the wrath. In chapter 14, he's being subdued, but you can see that this king of Babylon and this king of Assyria are being described with the exact same metaphorical pseudonym. So that's a link to tell us that they represent the same character. Isaiah identifies pseudonyms with the arch tyrant either directly or through synonymous parallelisms. By means of pseudonyms, Isaiah has layered his book with many details of the end of the world if you link all of these ideas together. But again, when we use pseudonyms, it creates multiple layers of meaning, at least two. He can be God's anger at the injustice and the idolatry, or God's anger, he, the character, the king of Assyria, is kindled. His hand is lifted up. Yes, he is God's hand, but he's also doing his own thing and his own will. He is the left hand. His wrath is poured out. Now look at this one. People choose darkness. That can mean that they're not choosing right and truth and light. But it can also mean they're choosing him over the servant. We'll see a verse that shows that in just a minute. Their tongue utters lies. That tongue can be the lies that they're telling, but it can also be him, the character, the king of Assyria. They are burnt by fire and they are slain by the sword. And again, you can see that the yellow highlight behind fire and sword and tongue and hand means that these are also pseudonyms that could represent the tyrant and you have to read it in the context of the chapter to know which one it's referring to. Woe to those who suppose what is evil to be good. Evil, of course, again in Isaiah is covenant curse and good is covenant blessing. And here they're totally reversing God, making him to be the evil one and his blessings of covenant keeping to being things that are oppressing us and Good is put to be evil. And then watch this parallel statement here. They put darkness for light. They choose the character of the king of Assyria over the servant that God sends to deliver them. And light for darkness. They call the light evil in the end time. You won't though because you're studying Isaiah and you'll be able to tell darkness from light and light from darkness in this end time scenario. God's end time servant is represented in the text as a power of creation and we've seen this before. He shares several identical pseudonyms with the tyrant showing their arch rivalry. He competes with the arch tyrant for people's lives and souls and he serves as a creative force, an instrument of deliverance he engages in a life and death struggle with the arch tyrant, a very real life and death struggle. And the arch tyrant is like Goliath of old. And the servant is David in his faithfulness as of old. As God's hand and right hand, he releases the captives and oppressed of God's people. God appoints him an ensign to the nations to rally God's people to repent and to return. He serves as the voice of righteousness, as God's mouth to his covenant people. 
He is God's rod and staff wielding power over the king of Assyria or Babylon. He is the sword of God that slays God's enemies, a fire that consumes tyrants. Now let's take a look at some of these metaphorical pseudonyms as they apply to the servant. In chapter 49, thus says my Lord Jehovah, I will lift up my hand to the nations, raise my ensign to the peoples, and they will bring their sons in their bosoms and carry your daughters on their shoulders. Kings shall be their foster fathers and queens your nursing mothers. You can see right here from the context that this is the good guy. He's the right hand. He's God's ensign. Nephi gives us cool information regarding this very verse. But behold, thus saith the Lord God, when the day cometh that they shall believe in me, that I am Christ. This is speaking of the house of Israel, of the Jews, the Lamanites, the 10 tribes, the branches of Israel in the last days. In the day that they believe in me, that I am Christ, that I have covenanted with their fathers, that they shall be restored in the flesh, upon the earth, unto the lands of their inheritance. This is the mission of the servant in the end time, the temporal mission of restoring Israel to her promised lands in the flesh and upon the earth. And it shall come to pass that they shall be gathered in from their long dispersion, from the isles of the sea, from the four parts of the earth, and the nations of the Gentiles shall be great in the eyes of me, saith God, in carrying them forth to the lands of their inheritance. Now we saw the nations of the Gentiles gathered against Israel on the one hand, but here on the other hand, there are righteous Gentiles. There are Gentiles who repent. There are Gentiles who have become kings and queens to save the house of Israel, to carry them on their shoulders. Yea, the kings of the Gentiles shall be nursing fathers unto them, and their queens shall become nursing mothers. Wherefore, the promises of the Lord are great unto the Gentiles, for he hath spoken it, and who can dispute? This is one of my favorite verses in the book of Isaiah with regard to the kings and the queens of the Gentiles. All you who live in the world, you inhabitants of the earth, look to the ensign when it is lifted on the mountains. Heed the trumpet when it is sounded. And you know that that ensign is the servant because here it is in parallel with a metaphorical pseudonym that is only used for the servant, the trumpet. Now in chapter 11, we have an interesting term. We have the sprig of Jesse, the sprig being a small branch, a, a, a tiny one, just starting, not a big branch like the branch that's gathered and all the house of Israel comes together in the end time. This is in the sprig phase when they're just starting to be gathered. And that sprig of Jesse stands for an ensign to the peoples. Now we've already seen that the ensign is the right hand. So this sprig of Jesse is also the servant. Well, what is a sprig of Jesse? We can do a little bit of cross-referencing here, and we can see that like King David himself, his ruling descendant was sometimes known simply as son of Jesse. Jesse being David's father. So in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, we see King David being called a son of Jesse, and of course, Jesse is his father. But here we're going to have a precedent set where all of the Davidic kings are called sons of Jesse, or in this case, a sprig of Jesse. Continuing on in chapter 11, it says that in that day, my Lord will again raise his hand to reclaim the remnant of his people. He will raise the ensign to the nations and assemble the exile 
of Israel. We see his mission here, this servant, to gather Israel back into covenant. And here in chapter 48, we see that it is God's hand that founded the earth. My right hand that stretched out the heavens. So this end time servant was from the beginning in the bosom of the Father. Who among you foretold these things? It is him, speaking of this right hand in chapter 48, that Jehovah loves, who shall perform his will against Babylon. His arm shall be against the Chaldeans. And this is probably one of the reasons why this servant is marred, because he is preaching against Babylon, like Lehi, when he told Jerusalem they're going to be destroyed. That wasn't something that they wanted to hear or anything that they believed. And therefore, they persecuted Lehi, and they sought to kill him. And this same scenario will play out as this servant calls Babylon to repentance. Search and read it in the book of Jehovah. None is accounted for. Not one lacks her mate. Here we're seeing this imagery that we've talked about in Isaiah 34, where couples are being sealed in the book of life. By his mouth, he decreed it. By his spirit, he brings them together. It is he who allots them an inheritance, his hand that divides it by measure. So as the promised lands are being regained, he is dividing the inheritances of the saints. And by his mouth and by the spirit of God, he is enrolling them in the book of life. In chapter 11, again, he will smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips slay the wicked. Here we have the tables turning on that rod and that mouth and the breath and the lips that slew and oppressed the people. Jehovah called me before I was in the belly. Before I was in my mother's womb, he mentioned me by name. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He hath made me into a polished arrow. In his quiver, he kept me secret. So we can see here that in the end time, he's kind of like Moses. He doesn't even know who he is until the Lord calls him on his mission like he called Moses at that burning bush. Who among you fears Jehovah and heeds the voice of his servant? Who, though he walk in the dark and have no light, trusts in the name of Jehovah and relies on his God. Here we can see that the voice is directly linked to God's servant and that there are people that are walking in darkness without a light when he comes, but they're waiting, they're trusting, they're relying on God still. At the voice of Jehovah, the Assyrians will be terror-stricken, they who used to strike with the rod. At every sweep of the staff of authority, when Jehovah lowers it upon them, they will be fought in mortal combat. Can you see here that the voice is the staff of authority here? In the context, you can see that this is referring to the servant in the end time. Their captain, the Assyrian, shall expire in terror, and their officers shrink from the ensign, says Jehovah, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Now, of course, there are these names, these metaphorical pseudonyms that refer to both the tyrant and the servant, but just like we saw with the tyrant, the anger, the rage, the vengeance, the fury, that was all him, never the servant. And again, we have words that refer to the servant alone. And one of the big ones is righteousness. We'll see that directly linked in the text in just a minute. But he is also the trumpet. He's also the whip, the whip like Gideon. When Gideon went through with his men, when they were chasing the Midianites and they needed water and they needed bread and they asked some of the Israelites to help them. And those Israelites said, well, you know what? Midianites aren't defeated yet. 
um, we think that we're going to play you safe and not help you. And remember that Gideon told them that when he came back through after God had delivered the Midianites into his hands, he would scourge them. They would receive the whip for refusing to help their brothers that were defending them in the battle. And the servant here in the text in Isaiah 10 is compared to the whip of Gideon. So we might have a Captain Moroni thing here where there are penalties on the people who refuse to stand and help when it's critical and it's needed to defend the truth and liberty. He's called the arrow. We just saw that and we've also seen him as a sprig, a sprig of Jesse. And we see the servant named in other places in scripture in the Bible. We have him as the branch we saw in Isaiah. We have him as David in Ezekiel in a couple of places, in Jeremiah in a couple of places. And then that branch can also be seen again in Zechariah and Jeremiah as well. Again, the metaphorical pseudonyms are not just in Isaiah. They're, they are used by the other prophets as well. Joseph Smith said, Christ in the days of his flesh proposed to make a covenant with, speaking of the house of Israel and the house of Judah from earlier in the text there, but they rejected him and his proposals. And in consequence thereof, they were broken off. Remember the fig tree was cursed and no covenant was made with them at that time. But their unbelief has not rendered the promise of God of none effect. No, for there was another day, limited in David, which was the day of his power, and then his people Israel should be a willing people. And again on page 339 of the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, the throne and kingdom of David is to be given to another by the name of David in the last days, raised up out of his lineage. And as I hear people that have a hard time with the whole idea that there could be a servant that comes in the end time, it's my personal feeling that it's absolutely unnecessary to diminish the eternal mission and atonement of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in order to enthrone Father Adam in his rightful place. Neither is it necessary to minimize the role of the end time Davidic servant in order for Joseph Smith to fulfill his end time mission. Nor is it necessary to imagine that the redemptive temporal mission of the end time Davidic servant of redeeming the promised lands and fulfilling the covenants made with Israel's fathers in any way detracts from the redemptive spiritual mission of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in his ransoming of our souls from death and hell? The answer is yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. The servants of God act in a grand concert and a finale and an orchestration of everyone on the stage at the redemption of Zion in the end time, including the city of Enoch and all of those faithful righteous saints that have gone before. The servant is a trumpet, heralding the day of Jehovah, announcing Jehovah's coming to reign on the earth. God appoints him as a light to the nations, lighting up their darkness at the end of the world. He exemplifies righteousness and faithfulness to God's covenant in a time of wickedness. He is a chosen arrow hidden in God's quiver, a righteous branch that bears good fruit. He is God's saving arm through whom God intervenes to deliver his covenant people. We're gonna see that in just a minute. Let's take a look at some of those metaphorical pseudonyms for the servant in the actual text of Isaiah. This one's from chapter 18. Again, all you who live in the world, you inhabitants of the earth, look to the ensign when it is lifted up in the mountains or the nations. Heed the trumpet when it is sounded. And there that ensign is used right there in parallel with the trumpet. 
Who has raised up righteousness from the east, calling him to the place of his foot? Who has delivered nations to him, toppled their rulers and rendering them as dust to his sword, as driven stubble to his bow? Here we saw that the sword was linked to the servant and in the context of the righteousness coming forward in the earth, it's in parallel with the bow and with righteousness there. We'll see a lot of his code names paralleled with righteousness. Here it is light paralleled with righteousness. Then shall your light break through like the dawn and your healing, which is always associated with the Savior, speedily appear. Your righteousness will go before you and the glory of Jehovah will be your rear guard. Here is righteousness paralleled with faithfulness in verse 5 of chapter 11. Righteousness will be as a band about his waist, faithfulness a girdle round his loins. Now this one is pretty fascinating. We're going to go into Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 where it says that a shoot will spring up from the stock of Jesse and a branch from its graft bear fruit. This verse is particularly fascinating. We've talked about it before, but we discussed how that shoot or that rod in the King James Version that springs up from the stock of Jesse, from ancient Israel's Davidic kings and the greatest Davidic king of all, Jesus Christ. That shoot springs up from that stock or that stem and that shoot is not one of the branches. It's actually an offshoot and in the Hebrew it's a hoiter. It's a water sprout coming off to the side. In D&C 113, Joseph Smith actually asks the Lord what that rod or that shoot is. We notice that it's kind of a wild branch representing the Gentiles. And the Lord tells him, it is a servant in the hands of Christ, who is partly a descendant of Jesse, as well as of Ephraim, or of the house of Joseph, on whom there is laid much power. Now, we've drawn a line through the descendant of Jesse and the house of Joseph, because when we compare this to the sprig in verse 10, those things are identical in both verses, and we're kind of looking for the differences here. We notice that he is partly of the line of the Davidic kings, okay, and that he is of Ephraim, and that upon him is laid much power. Let's take a look now at that sprig of Jesse in verse 10, who stands for an ensign to the people, who we already know is the servant. In DNC 113, when Joseph Smith asked who that sprig was, it said that it was a descendant of Jesse as well as of Joseph. Again, that's struck through because that was the same as we saw in the other verse about the rod. Unto whom rightly belongs the priesthood and the keys of the kingdom for an ensign, there's our metaphorical pseudonym there, and for the gathering of my people in the last days. Now this rightly belonging, the priesthood, can be referenced in DNC 107 when we talks about the descendants of Aaron. The bishopric is the presidency of the Aaronic priesthood and holds the keys or the authority of the same. No man has a legal right to this office to hold the keys of this priesthood, except he be a literal descendant of Aaron. So this legal right, this rightly belongs the priesthood, has to do with his lineage, his lineage from Aaron, and his right to reign as his lineage from David. Now let's take a minute and compare the rod from verse one or the shoot in Avraham Gileadi's translation and this sprig from verse 10, which the King James Version translates as a kind of a root where the branch will come out of this. The wild branch, the hoiter, is of Ephraim and has much power but is only partly descended from Jesse. Whereas the sprig from verse 10 is a direct descendant to whom rightly belongs the priesthood and he is the ensign.
Now, it's interesting because priesthood and the keys of the kingdom, even the gathering of the people of Israel in the last days was initiated by the prophet Joseph Smith. So we can see here in the text itself that their missions go hand in hand. They fit dovetail together. Now let's take a look really quickly at Wikipedia and notice something about the Jewish tradition of the messianic figures that come on the stage in the end time. Jewish tradition alludes to two redeemers, both of whom are called Mashiach and are involved in ushering in the millennial age. There is a Mashiach ben David and a Mashiach ben Joseph. That means the Messiah, son of David, and the Messiah or the deliverer or savior, the son of Joseph. In general, the term Messiah, unqualified, will refer to the Mashiach ben David. But we can see here, right here in Isaiah chapter 11, and as verified in DNC's 113, these two figures and characters in the end time that work hand in hand to orchestrate the coming millennial age. I will strengthen you and I will also succor you and uphold you with my righteous right hand. And Avraham Gileadi notes that a more correct translation right there would have been with righteousness, my right hand in chapter 41. And in chapter 62, right there in parallel, the Lord has sworn by his right hand, his mighty arm. We see here that just like there were two hands, there was the left hand that was the tyrant and the right hand that was the servant, that God has two arms as well. We're going to see that one is righteousness, a symbol of the servant, and one is salvation. Let's take a look at that in the text. Who made his glorious arm proceed? We see this parallel again between the right hand and the arm in chapter 63, at the right hand of Moses. So his arm, that arm of righteousness, that right hand brought about salvation for him. Do you remember that Yeshua translated into English is the savior? He is salvation? So this righteousness, this arm, that is the right hand, brings about salvation for him. His righteousness rallies to his cause. And we're gonna see this in several places. My righteousness shall be at hand and my salvation proceed. He prepares the way for the return of Jesus Christ. My arms, the arm of righteousness and salvation in parallel here in chapter 51, verse five, my arms shall judge the peoples. The isles anticipate me awaiting my arm. You can see here again that the arm is highlighted with the servant color in the background because they might be awaiting the servant and they might be awaiting Jesus Christ. Both are valid interpretations of this metaphorical pseudonym of awaiting the arm. Now the servant and the Lord, just like we saw with the servant and the tyrant, have some names that are shared. We've already seen that light is a shared metaphorical pseudonym between the servant of righteousness and the Lord of salvation. And we also saw that they are both an arm Shared code names between the Lord, servant and the Lord show that his servant and the Lord are acting in concert together. Pseudonyms such as the arm, a covenant, faithfulness, a judge, a king, a lawgiver, and light. All of these are pseudonyms that can represent them both. They're also warriors and sons on the throne of David. Thus says Jehovah, observe justice and perform righteousness, for my salvation will soon come when my righteousness 
is revealed. Can you see the multi layers and the different ways you can read these verses once you understand how Isaiah uses metaphorical pseudonyms? Now this one is interesting because there are some pseudonyms in Isaiah that represent the Lord alone. And teacher is one of the interesting ones because in the New Testament, Paul is referred to as a teacher. And in the Book of Mormon, Nephi is referred to as a teacher. But in Isaiah, only the Lord is referred to as a teacher. And we can see this because teacher is in parallel with the master. Though my Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet shall your teacher remain hidden no longer, but your eyes shall see the master. I love the fact that through scripture, the Lord alone is the Lamb of God. He is the Holy One of Israel. There are holy ones that follow him, but he is the Holy One of Israel and the valiant one of Israel. And again, peace is also a direct link to the Savior as well as healing. And we see many metaphorical pseudonyms and other names for the Lord throughout scripture. The man of sorrows, the rose of Sharon. It's so fun. A lot of these names, we could do a whole lesson just going on to why those are metaphorical pseudonyms for Christ. The bridegroom, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the chief cornerstone, the day spring, the rock, the I am. O oh, Jehovah, be our strength of arm from morning to morning, our salvation in troubled times. You can see the direct parallel there. And in Isaiah 52, verse 7, how comely upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger announcing peace, who brings good tidings of good, who heralds salvation saying to Zion, your God reigns. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain still till her righteousness shines like a light, her salvation like a flaming torch. This is God's plan of action for us. God appoints the king of Assyria at Babylon and empowers him for his destructive task. And God determined beforehand that this would bring a new and a higher creation out of the arch tyrant's chaos. The earth and all humanity are on an upward path of progression that cannot be impeded. Before the millennial era begins, wickedness and tyranny must be erased from the earth. So these Mormon ads depict our mission in the end time, the search and rescue mission that we're about to look at in Jeremiah 16 and the 10 virgins. Do you have oil in your lamp? Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he had driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith the Lord, and they shall fish them. And after will I send for many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain or nation, and from every hill or city, and out of the holes of the rocks. Those hunters are fishers with power. They are the 144,000. For mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. And first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double, because they have defiled my land, and they have filled mine inheritance with the carcasses of detestable and abominable things. O oh Lord, my strength, my fortress, and my refuge in the day of affliction, the Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth, and shall say, 
Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. These are repentant Gentiles. Shall a man make gods unto himself? And they are no gods. Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know mine hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. And this will lead us directly into our next lesson where we do the same thing. We take the pseudonyms, we take the types, and we build this grand mission of the servant and the people that follow him in the end time in our next lesson on the mission of the servant. For this lesson, read chapters 41 through 43 of Isaiah, page 96 to 100, the rest of chapter 6 in your end from the beginning in the older edition, and pages 75 to 78 in the newer edition. And we'll look forward to joining you for the mission of the servant in the next lesson.